Ernest Burgess was born in Ontario, Canada in 1886 to a Congregationalist minister and his wife. He moved to the United States and completed a Ph.D. in sociology at the University of Chicago in 1913. After teaching for a few years in other Midwestern schools, he returned to Chicago in 1916 and began five decades as one of the leaders of what became the Chicago School of Social Theory and Research. Though he himself never married, he studied marriage, families, aging, and other social phenomena. Burgess retired in the early 1950s and died in 1966. He is most remembered for the ideas in this 1928 article published the year after he was promoted to full professor at Chicago and a few years before Lewis Wirth also joined the department. The concentric zones that he imagined as a framework for describing city structure and evolution have shaped the field of urban sociology probably more than any other single concept and provided a framework for the urban ecology approach to studying cities. Although this article came before most articles we have already read and influenced most of them in a fundamental way, we have delayed reading Burgess's classic study until now because he did not write it simply to put forward this idea of an urban bullseye of concentric rings. These patterns were only a tool, a tool that he developed in order to study the substantive problem of segregation of people divided by social differences such as ethnicity as the city expanded and deconcentrated. Burgess was known as the young sociologist when he joined the sociology department at Chicago because the other older professors all had shifted into the new discipline from other fields. He was the first member of the department to complete a graduate degree specifically in sociology. He and Robert Park were trying to make sense out of the huge, rapidly growing cities of the early 20th century, and they had the fine example of Chicago immediately available to study. In this article, Burgess included a bullseye diagram of concentric circles as a hand-drawn and lettered figure, which he called the growth of the city. This diagram has been endlessly repeated and used as an abstract description of many other cities as well. Even the title of the figure communicates his clear intention that these rings are not some kind of static, unchanging boundaries, but a product of dynamic social changes taking place throughout the society of which the city is a part. It is true, though, that as he presents them, these rings are a kind of snapshot that captures a particular moment in the growth of a city. He does not show us, for example, what the city looked like at some earlier time or what it might eventually turn into in the future. However, the social character of each of these rings is meant to illustrate something about the process of growth the city has been through in the past. Each of the descriptions he gives of these rings also says something about Burgess and about the perspective adopted by his group in the Chicago School. First, at the center of the bullseye, we find what he describes in the text as the Central Business District, or CBD, but which he simply labels as the loop in this figure. This label is a dead giveaway that he is using Chicago itself as a model for his abstract diagram since the loop is the familiar name for the central area of Chicago with its skyscrapers and concentration of economic activity. He points out that this central business district, or CBD, has very few actual residents since the demand for commercial space is so strong that land becomes far too expensive for most people to remain in residential structures there. Any people still living in the CBD usually concentrate into multi-story apartment buildings or condominium towers, and at the time he was writing, such buildings were disappearing to make room for more skyscrapers. The Central Business District is the descendant of the original pre-industrial walking city, oldest part of the city, and sometimes the gleaming new buildings are actually built on top of an older layer, like the one that forms underground Atlanta beneath the central skyscrapers of that city. Transformation of the entire pre-industrial city area into a specialized nucleus of financial and commercial specialization provides a great example of the tremendous expansion of scale that occurs when cities grow into the component parts of a larger urban society. The next ring outside the loop in his diagram has two labels, 
the factory zone, but also the zone in transition. This is the best example of his intention to show us an unfolding process of change, not just a timeless structure as a model of city organization. Both labels hint at important aspects of change in the history of the city. Pre-industrial cities had nothing called a factory zone because the whole idea of a factory, with its inanimate energy sources, mass production techniques, concentrated labor force, and so on, is a feature of the industrial transformation of society. In its earliest stages, this transformation produced new structures like factories and warehouses at the immediate edge of the old walking city, within easy reach of its residents. Most early factory workers walked to work from their tenement houses in the old original city. But as the city grew and land became more valuable the closer you got to the economic engine at its center, these intensive uses of land made less and less business sense. Industry and manufacturing kept retreating further and further out into the countryside. The spaces that had been warehouse districts or factory districts gave way to new residential developments and the older tenement neighborhoods that were left behind underwent a transformation to new occupants. Burgess describes the people who arrived to fill in this evolving inner ring of the city as a, quote, mixed population of youth and old age, aspiring and defeated individuals, pleasure-seeking bohemians, and hard-working students, unquote. This description captures many facts about Chicago and other, and other early 20th century U.S. inner cities. Clubs, the growing universities located there, the skid rows with their homeless men, and above all, the proliferation of immigrant neighborhoods. For fueling this expansion of the city was the underlying population growth discussed in detail by many other writers. Growth due both to faster natural increase as death rates declined, and to the ongoing flood of new arrivals from the countryside and even from other countries. In expanding cities, the people working in factories and commercial establishments still for the most part remained pedestrians who walked to work. So Burgess shows us another ring outside the zone in transition, which he calls the zone of working men's homes. Today we would call them blue-collar communities, filled with modest homes from which the blue-collar workers could conveniently reach their places of work, some of which remained in the old factory district and some of which were moving outward with the flow of population. Beyond the working men's homes, Burgess places what he calls the residential zone, so surely the working men are also residents of the city, he tells us we find people who live in detached single-family homes, who enjoy the luxury of mass education as it makes its first appearance in early 20th century America, and who he describes as believers in, quote, great middle-class ideals still akin to those of rural American society, unquote. This is a wonderful example of the same characteristic Chicago school perspective later adopted by Lewis Wirth, the idea that rural pre-industrial social life was governed by a shared consensus of values that it, fur that it furnished people with an essential sense of belonging to a real community, and that in consequence, people in the past enjoyed good mental health, strong moral principles, and harmony with one another. Burgess is hinting here that all this is somehow slipping away in the city, save where it still survives in the residential zone, or as we would call it now, the suburbs. Finally, out even further beyond the middle-class suburbs, Burgess describes an outer ring of larger estates belonging to the urban elite, living in expensive houses on large parcels of property. They are still tied to the city as the source of their wealth, so they must get back and forth from their mansions to the central business district. But these are not streetcar suburbs out on the edge of the urban area. These people are commuters using the new 20th century technology of the automobile. In fact, he is careful to add a detail about how people living out in the elite outskirts of the city must have not only a car, but, quote, an automobile of commensurate rank, unquote. A truly wonderful phrase. So Burgess's concentric rings give us a snapshot of what happens in a city over time as it deconcentrates from its smaller, earlier pre-industrial form. Its growing population spreads out over the landscape, settling in different zones according to the relative status of different places and the ability of each group to afford one kind of place or another. 
Since it is a dynamic process, as new groups continuously arrive and expand the city more and more, specific neighborhoods witness a parade of different groups moving outward through them. For example, immigrants who arrived from northwestern Europe in the 19th century gradually moved outward and were replaced by immigrants from southern and eastern Europe. These arrivals, in their turn, were displaced by newer groups, including internal migrants, many black but also some, arriving from the American South during the Great Migration, and also including recent arrivals such as groups from Latin America, Asia, and the Middle East. This process of groups replacing each other as new waves of immigrants arrive and as the city continues to expand outward is generally known as invasion and succession because not only do some groups move outward as they become more integrated into the city's economic and social fabric, but to some extent they may also be pushed outward by the arrival of new residents who look, talk, and live differently from the way they do. This invasion and succession aspect of the growth of cities is one clear hint of the underlying issues that prompted Burgess to write this article in the first place, the sorting out of the city along lines of ethnicity and social class as an intrinsic part of the deconcentration process. Most important and interesting things to remember about Burgess' concentric zone model of urban ecology is that, although it is often treated as an almost completely abstract universal pattern that we can look at, we can look for in cities of any time and place, the social contents of his different concentric rings are in fact the product of a really unique historical process, specifically about the structural consequences for city life for any place that found itself in turn of the century America, where several drastic changes all overlapped with each other in a truly unique combination. First, the Industrial Revolution was transforming the American economy, creating an explosion of new jobs and a demand for new kinds of workers that was felt above all in certain key cities, including Chicago, that grew from almost nothing. As in many cities around the world, the expanding scale and the increased efficiency and volume of material production raised living standards and contributed to lower death rates which accelerated natural increase of urban populations and helped provide new workers to satisfy the demand. Rural urban migration also played a part, as seen in other places, but in Chicago and some other U.S. cities around 1900, this demand for labor also pulled in a huge wave of international immigrants who poured into Chicago in particular. The expanding city produced a new social problem, one that Burgess described as, quote, the problem of residential segregation of racial and immigrant groups, unquote. Usually poor and always strange and new in terms of their language, customs, dress, and sometimes even physical appearance or religion, new arrivals were not welcomed with open arms by the existing residents of Chicago or most other early industrial cities they had real problems to find a place where they would be allowed to live. Burgess describes the zone in transition, the inner ring nearest to the central business district, as the most likely place for these crowds of new arrivals to find places to live. But why did these groups tend to settle in the zone in transition? Some of the reasons are economic, but others are social and cultural. First, since existing city residents were moving outward as part of the deconcentration of the city, the older, smaller housing stock near the center of the city experienced a lot of vacancies and high turnover. This meant that someone new in town had a reasonable chance to discover an available place. The inferior quality of this older, smaller housing stock meant that absentee landlord owners couldn't expect to get top dollar for such places, so the low rents also fit in well with the generally poor economic situation of these new arrivals. Second, though, any landlords or anyone selling a house in other more affluent and respectable parts of the city, such as the residential zone, were under a lot of community pressure not to do business with strange, impoverished new arrivals. Just as intermarriage between foreign-born and native-born people was almost as high a taboo as interracial marriage, immigrants were often excluded from trying to buy houses in other parts of the city by explicit covenants in real estate contracts, 
which were not ruled illegal until well into the second half of the 20th century. Low rents and vacancies in the zone in transition, combined with exclusionary policies in most of the rest of the city, guaranteed that the zone in transition would function, as Burgess put it, as a port of entry or gateway for new arrivals, both from the rural American South and from other countries abroad. Burgess observes that several different dimensions of social differences often overlapped and joined together to reinforce the sorting out of the population into distinct segregated neighborhoods. These different dimensions included things like, quote, an alien culture, a low economic status, and a different race, unquote. He also could have added different languages and religions, although these probably fit within the alien culture idea. The result of this sorting out was an enormously complex mosaic of ethnic neighborhoods in Chicago and in other U.S. cities that shared in the experience of receiving the wave of immigrants and the great migration from the South. Geographers and anthropologists have had a field day for decades charting this diversity and its political, economic, and cultural consequences. But staying true to his core outlook oriented toward the process of social change, Burgess finds yet another social process related to the invasion and succession of one ethnic group after another passing through neighborhoods in the city. He points out that after a group has been in the city for a while, the people in it begin to find their ways into more mainstream kinds of jobs and also neighborhoods. Several special terms have developed quite different meanings to describe different aspects of this process. For example, Wirth talks about assimilation. For social scientists, this term borrowed from biology has nothing to do with the immigrants themselves. As you view this lecture, you yourself are assimilating your last meal, turning the food into muscles, blood cells, and so on. Assimilation is something that the host society does, absorbing and accepting new arrivals and fitting them into the larger social picture. If a society passes laws restricting where immigrants can live, what jobs they can take, what schools their children can attend, and so on, that society is failing to assimilate the new arrivals. What immigrants themselves do is called acculturation, when it involves learning the local language or learning to like the local food, local forms of sports and other entertainment, and generally converting to the values and everyday rules of conduct of the host community. What immigrants do is called adaptation when they begin to participate actively in local institutionalized processes like formal schooling or labor force participation. So the gradual conversion of new arrivals into full residents of the city involves both sides of this coin. On one side, acceptance by the host community and on the other, active efforts by immigrants to join in the local culture as well as the local community. Burgess provides an interesting evaluation of this process when he compares the black Americans from the South who had settled in Harlem with the more newly arrived Polish and Italian communities in New York City. The Harlem residents, he suggests, were more assimilated and more acculturated to American society than the Poles or the Italians because they already spoke English and had been part of American society for generations. Looking back from almost a century later, we now can see that he was spectacularly wrong about which of these groups would succeed better at moving into the American economic mainstream and move out toward the more affluent rings of the urban bullseye, which would face continued high barriers, entry, lack of assimilation into mainstream society. The 1928 article by Burgess is most well known for his sketch and description of the concentric zones resulting from the expansion of a city in both area and population. However, he also presents a different perspective on the growth process that prefigured other ecological models like the radial sectors described by Homer Hoyt. When discussing the movement of population in his last main section of the article, he links the major transportation routes leading into the city to urban sorting and deconcentration. Quote, the great arterial business streets of the city have been and remain the highways of invasion, unquote. He illustrates this idea with a second diagram less often remembered by people citing his work today. 
This time the diagram is explicitly about Chicago, showing the major streets leading away from the central city in all directions. He describes which ethnic groups concentrated along each of these boulevards, sorting out the expanding city into ethnic wedges as they went. People of different national origins tended to settle along different streets. The style of research pioneered by Burgess and his Chicago colleagues has been called urban ecology because it borrowed an ecological model from biological science. The invasion and succession model Burgess uses was originally developed to describe how diverse plant species compete with each other, gradually changing the mix of organisms in an area. As the first plants establish conditions favorable to further growth, new species can invade an area, and if they're well suited to the environmental conditions, can gradually take over the space. In the case of a developing forest, eventually a climax community of trees and other plants may take shape. This climax community is defined as a relatively stable ecological stage or community, especially of plants, that is achieved through successful adjustment to an environment. Using this forest analogy to describe urban growth creates interesting images for us to consider, but the notion of a stable climax community has some awkward features. For example, this could imply that some ethnic groups are more well adapted to an urban setting than others, that their social, economic, and cultural backgrounds are in some sense inferior or superior. It also could imply that there is some stable environmental background, against which the fitness of different groups is being tested. This is a strange assumption about cities, because as almost completely artificial, man-made environments, they're constantly changing, and are in fact created and changed by these very groups of people. It seems impossible to define successful adjustment to an environment, when it is just as likely that the group will change the environment, as that the group will simply change itself and adapt to a previous environment. Whatever the weakness of this ecological analogy, Burgess goes on to explore many features of the ethnic sorting out of Chicago and other cities that eventually grew into major long-term research directions for sociology as a discipline. For example, he was interested in the fact that some ethnic groups, especially Jews, seemed to move out along their chosen major streets faster than other groups, like Eastern Europeans from Poland, Italians, and especially African Americans. He implies in the article that such faster movement across space in the city might be a measure of social and economic success, a faster adaptation to the city environment. And other researchers have followed up this possibility in the following decades. He also singles out for study the particularly high level of intergroup conflict that he observed between black migrants arriving from the rural south and certain particular ethnic groups. In the race riots that swept through many U.S. cities in 1919, as the country began to get back on its feet after the First World War and the influenza pandemic, Burgess documents the fact that some of the most violent antagonism toward the growing black populations in these cities came from recent immigrants of Irish and German origin. Leaders of the gangs that attacked and killed black citizens came disproportionately from these groups. He explains this special antagonism with another ecological principle, quoting from Carter Woodson to show that these ethnic groups were in closest economic competition with newly arrived black workers. Quote, the first exhibition of this prejudice was seen among the lower classes of white people, largely Irish and German, who devoted to menial labor competed directly with the Negroes. It did not require a long time, however, for this feeling to react on the higher classes of whites where Negroes had settled in large groups." Unquote. It is worth pointing out that at the beginning of the 20th century, immigrants from Ireland, Poland, or Italy were not actually considered white themselves. Recent scholarship on the history of concepts of race shows how these groups became white during the 20th century. Burgess also looks at what we might consider the opposite of such ethnic antagonism, noting what he called, quote, the frequent propinquity of Negroes and Italian settlements in our larger cities, unquote. He did not offer any explanations why these two groups ended up in the same area so often, but many later scholars have followed up on this idea and explored what became known as elective affinity, 
the tendency for specific groups of different ethnic origins to be in contact with each other, either residentially or in other ways, such as occupations or commercial contacts. For example, in late 20th century American cities, many of the small markets and convenience stores in black neighborhoods were owned or operated by Korean immigrants or people from the Indian subcontinent. Burgess concludes this classic article with a regular laundry list of additional projects that he recommends to his colleagues and students for further study. Virtually all of these show his growing preoccupation with one issue in particular, the problem of race relations in the growing American cities. He wishes for more information about how the invasion and succession process affects many aspects of neighborhoods, especially when this succession produces a segregated black neighborhood as its climax state, as he would put it. How does this affect property values? How is it related to other land uses, such as proximity to different types of workplaces or to districts that concentrate entertainment or vice activities? What variations can be observed in the range of different types of black neighborhoods? These and other related concerns laid out a roadmap for a lot of the urban research that took place during the rest of the 20th century, not only at the University of Chicago, but across the social sciences in general. 